All right, you guys, I think we'll get started. Hello, good afternoon, and thanks for coming. It's nice to see some familiar faces, um, and also some new faces, that's great. I want to just introduce myself briefly. My name is Guido, and I've lived in Vermont for, gosh, it's a little more than 20 years now. It's the longest I've ever lived anywhere in my life. Um, I grew up in Italy, which is where I first learned about herbal medicine, uh, really from my family. And then my mom, who's American, um, took me to Kansas City. Uh, my whole family relocated there when I was about 14. And it took me a couple years to really feel this amazing void. Like, we never went wild harvesting. We never went out into the woods to get berries or herbs. And it was at that point I realized that herbal medicine was something that was really important to me. Um, kind of started studying it and uh, devoting myself to it as best I could. Landed in Vermont in 96, 97. Started growing medicinal plants um, organically and have kind of moved forward from there. Um, my work is kind of divided between clinical practice, so I work one-on-one -on -one with folks to kind of address specific health concerns, but also to help bring medicinal plants into their lives. Um, research development and formulation, so I also am involved in extraction and quality control for um, herbal products companies. Um, and then just the joy of being outside and going to the woods. Vermont is an amazing place for some of our most important medicinal plants, or American ginseng. Um, so now I get to bring my daughter around with me, um, sometimes more willingly than others, um, but she's great. And it's great to see sort of her innate joy around playing with medicinal plants. So today's talk will be a little bit, I would say, background. Um, background as to why I'm here, and hopefully a little bit of why you're here, too. Um, our interest in moving beyond primary plant metabolites, like proteins, fats, and carbs, and thinking about secondary plant metabolites, and not even just vitamins and minerals, but really some of these compounds like compounds and um, iridoids and saponins and this diversity of plant chemistry that we're exposed to or ideally would be exposed to on a daily basis if we sort of were the human animals we were born to be, right? And ultimately, I hope to convince you that there's still a way to get right back to that, despite the fact that we hang out in square boxes a lot. It's called herbal medicine. And herbal medicine retains this really interesting thread um, that has been with us since way before we were human beings. And that is these wild, unhybridized plants, like dandelion as an archetypal one, which we can bring into our gardens, into our lawns, into our farms, and experience a range of benefits. Not just for ourselves, but for our gardens and our lawns and our farms, too. And my ultimate contention is, though, even I work even though I work one-on-one -on -one with people individually in clinic, herbal medicine and the incorporation of these plants into our lives actually changes communities and changes culture. And so I really, I really want this to come back into our daily lives in this Western culture that's kind of radiating out of this country we call the United States at this particular point in time. There's some real issues with that type of radiation, and I hope we can correct it using herbal medicine. So the concept that I'd like for us to come back to as a touchstone is this idea of wellness, which I'm sure you all have heard of, but not wellness on an individual basis, but wellness in terms of a wellness ecology. My ultimate contention is that um, we're inextricably bound to our ecology. There's just no way out of that, right? And if we work towards individual health, we don't do as well as if we work towards ecological wellness and building a wellness ecology. And that's why I'm really excited, you know, about the work that um, Dan is doing and all of you are doing uh, with the Biomedical Food Association, because that's really what we're talking about, right? Is understanding that these secondary plant metabolites and, and building bionutrient and phytonutrient density in our food supply is also affecting our farming practices and our ecology. And so we're building this wellness ecology together, okay? So I start... It might be a little different than, than some of the other conversations you've had or will have at this conference. Is how plants can affect individual human beings, right? That's how I learned um, about these plants. You know, you take dandelions to help digestion. You help. You take ginger for nausea. You can take echinacea, um, the true cell your lymphatic system, and help with immunity. So that's kind of the perspective I'm coming from. But it's taught me so much more in terms of how integrated herbal medicine can make up for the rest of the ecology as well. 
But rather than coming from the soil or from the farm, I'm coming from the human, right? So I hope to start from there and then kind of branch out. So a little bit maybe of a different direction than what you've seen um, in other talks at this conference. And the place I start often, and this happens over and over again in clinic, is folks will come into the office with what I might call like spirit sickness or Western I don't know what we want to call it. There are so many threads that come into that, right? But one of the major ones, I think, is that we lack a sort of collective cultural mythology or touchstone here in this particular place in this particular time, which is very, very different from what traditional societies have, what indigenous societies have. And it's kind of messed up for me to see that the dominant paradigm and culture in the world today is this very unrooted, non-indigenous, non-traditional culture. I think we run the real risk of kind of cutting off the roots of all indigenous cultural systems if we continue to just run with what the United States has put out to the world over the last 50, 60, 70 years. Okay. So I call it spirit sickness, and I want to try and put a little bit of a finger on it. Um, what exactly are we talking about here? And one of the folks um, that I think has articulated this incredibly well is this sort of union just and feminist, and her name is Marion Woodman. Um, have any of you run to her work? And, you know, famous and I would say very accomplished and incredible work um, that she has put out. So she's the one that kind of first taught me that we really lack what most indigenous cultures have, which is a collective mythos that we can all kind of agree on. And we see this in like our political, our economic, our cultural conversations, right? There's no common touchstone for us. So what the heck is going on there, and how can we remedy it? Part of it is collective rituals and collective ceremonies, right? A touchstone that we can all agree on that takes us apart from our day-to-day -day activity. Every indigenous culture has this and spends a lot of time on these rituals, right? Marion Woodman identifies this as being a really important part of being a healthy society. Um, and then concepts that exist like what is the divine feminine? What is the divine masculine? What is like our quality standard or our perfection standard, right? Our current culture has taken those concepts in very weird directions. And Woodman articulates this really well. So for example, the divine feminine, which she articulates, I think, in this great way, um, I'm into Latin, and so I really like this pun, mater as mother and matter as stuff. So the divine feminine, which is this, as Chinese medicine would say, yin, right? nurturing, holding, soil, has been replaced with stuff. We're all missing this connection to the deep source of creative energy, the yin, the archetypal mother, and we've replaced it, or at least are told to replace it, with stuff. I remember very clearly, you know, after 9-11, what the exhortation was when we as a collective culture were lost, fragmented, didn't know what to do. We're looking for unity. We're looking for that collective mythos, that source of creativity. What was it? Glock shop. That's what we replaced the divine source of creativity with. Stuff. And as we know, you know, I don't have to tell you, that's never really going to be the same as dream time, as connection to nature, as deep personal relationships, right? The other thing that's really interesting is that the divine masculine, which is sort of this idea of trying to find clarity and expand into new spaces, you know, this yang idea, heaven or sky as a counterbalance of soil or earth in traditional Chinese medicine, has now become this idea of dominating, competing, overpowering. So just as we've lost our connection to what Whitman calls the divine feminine, we also really have lost and perverted our connection to what many call the divine masculine, too. And we see both of them <coughs> distorted in traditional, or in our current Western culture. The other piece, um, and this is something you know I get into a little bit um, in boardrooms, for example, and in the business world, mm -hmm. is that um, nature and perfection are really not synonymous. And in fact, nature favors imperfection, right? And iteration, iterative processes, evolutionary processes. And we'll look at this over and over again in the over the next hour or so, but this idea that we have to strive for perfection as if perfection was something that ever could be achieved is weird. And it tends to put us in a place where we never really can succeed. 
But at the same time, better drink plenty of coffee and work 24 hours a day in order to try and achieve this perfection standard, which really never can be achieved, but it's a great way to achieve the goal of making money for our right. So all these threads, I think Marianne Woodman pulled them out really well and articulates to us how different this is from all indigenous and traditional cultural systems. And of course, I study these systems because that's where herbal medicine comes from. All traditional indigenous cultural systems have this use of wild plants as part of it. And as we'll see, it's really not limited to human beings and traditional cultural systems either. So if our culture has these weird threads and these somewhat perversions of these important archetypal energies that exist in these areas, what are we to do about it? Well, the thing that gives me a lot of hope is that culture is not static, right? It's constantly changing just like languages. And so we have the opportunity and the privilege to become involved in remodeling the culture. And we're seeing a lot of these threads right now over the last few years, right? And it gives me a lot of hope to see these conversations coming up. And a lot of them are traumatic, and a lot of them make some people uncomfortable, especially if they've had privileged roles historically. But that might just be okay. Because certainly people who have not had privileged roles historically have had to experience a measure of discomfort now and again in Western culture. So let's get into this. I think more than an opportunity and a privilege, it is in fact our responsibility to engage in this cultural remodeling right now. Okay? And I think herbal medicine can be an important part of this. So one of the things that I think is most difficult that I've seen and I see with clients that I work with is that our 20th century Western culture, and particularly in the United States, with the myth of the self-made man and the American dream, right? What's that mythos? Which maybe is one of the only things we can all kind of agree on is like a, a collective shared thing. It's like, I pull myself up by my bootstraps. I have made my own wealth, and if I have the gumption and the grit, right, I'll achieve success, I'll be a millionaire or billionaire or whatever it is that the perfection standard sets out for us. And that's nice, but it's very unrealistic. No one ever pulls themselves up by their bootstraps on their own. There's always support. Does that make sense? Even if it's just your parents. Okay? Even my grandfather, whose parents both died when he was 13 and he had five, six brothers and sisters that he had to raise on his own, there was a social safety net. There was the Young Boys Club and the YMCA. And he worked there and he had resources there. Anyway, what I'm saying is that it might not actually be a true thing, right? That we can all pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and become the self-made man. However, it has led to this cult of the individual. And we see it all over again, right? Nowadays. If you need welfare, it's because you're not working hard enough. And if you've succeeded, it's all thanks to your efforts. <clears throat> that stands in really stark opposition to traditional cultures which say, I can never succeed without the community. So these are my friends. Um, I go and I get to work in East Africa for about a month every year um, on the edge of the Serengeti and the Maasai community. And so uh, and you can't see him very well, but this is my friend Nicholas, and he's wearing Western pants because he went to school in Nairobi, right, and knows English really well. This is his brother Mongoye and their father, um, Titipa, wrote together. And they are, um, you know, he's the patriarch. He has about six wives, I think. Um, and Nicholas and Mongue are both children of his first wife, uh, the Maasai Array, um, or the Maasai Array. And Mongoya, you know, I'm talking to him a little bit through Nicholas, and he says, you know, I'm going to go get married. Um, it'll be my first wife, and it's time for me to, like, have my own boma and venture out. I'm like, oh, who would you meet? Who are you marrying? He's like, well, my wife is this woman, and it's great. I'm like, really? Why are you doing that? Why don't you marry for love? Why don't you follow your heart? And he's like, well, that's all fine and good, but if I didn't listen to my father, our village would fall apart. If I didn't engage in these rituals that are part of our community, then our community would fall apart. So every year, someone from the outside comes into the hospital with an injury from chasing down a hyena or an injury from chasing down a lion, right? Why do these Maasai warriors go out and chase down lions? It's ridiculously dangerous. It's 
part of their collective ritual. Right? To train the Morani warriors the way they've always been trained and engage in these rituals. Yes, people need to do it, and yes, people get hurt doing it. Yes, people need to make personal sacrifices, like not marry for love, but maybe marry for family considerations. But what Mongolia said to me was, if I don't do that, our community will die. So to traditional indigenous cultures, this subsuming of the individual for the good of the community is not a paradox. They get it. They get that individual health cannot be achieved by selfishly focusing on the individual. Individual health can only be achieved by bringing up the community. And if we do that, we feel better, we feel stronger, and as a side effect, we get back to what Marion Woodman was talking about, the connection to mater, the true source, right? Rather than stuff. So really, really interesting, okay? This idea that unless we all are well together, I, as an individual, cannot be well. So following self-interest is actually detrimental to me in the end, although it may seem in the short term to be a game. So how can we apply these ideas in the 21st century? What can we learn by observing living systems? And I really, being an herbalist, I turn to plants. They're my best teachers. When I'm curious, when I'm sad, when I am inspired, I go out and I sit with trees and plants. And I think drinking a lot of lemon balm tea made, made me do that, <laughs> you know, over time. But um, we, can, we can learn a lot by observing plants and living systems. So before I get into that, you know, some summary. Individual health is linked to ecological health. There's no way around that. That's why we build phytonutrient-rich food. That's why we look at soil systems. Because we know that if we can improve the health of the ecology, we can improve individual health. What I'd like to convince you of is that the converse is also true. If we use traditional healing systems to improve individual health, the corollary is we also end up improving ecological health. Okay? Then, if we work with this link between the world around us and inside us, if we connect these ecologies together, then we renew that connection to what Marian Woodman calls the, calls the divine feminine, the mater the true source of creativity and inspiration. And I will tell you, I don't know if like that's the purpose of life, but it's the thing that makes me feel the best. When I feel inspired, when I feel like I'm in creative flow, it's kind of the same as love. It's like peak human experience. I don't quite know how else to describe it. It's the feeling that I want all my clients to achieve by working with me. Okay? And then, our spirit sickness and our chronic disease, particularly the chronic diseases of Western culture, we can't address them using individual focused treatments. We can only truly address them by addressing ecological health. It's the same thing Mongoya was telling me. He can't be well unless he makes his community and his ecology well. So similarly, if we're talking about cancer, cardiovascular disease, metabolic dysfunction like diabetes and obesity, we cannot address those on a case-by-case -case basis. It's just not going to work. Infection, life-threatening trauma, great. Focus on the person that's injured. But these chronic diseases and the spirit sickness that Western culture experiences, we cannot do it on a case-by-case -case basis. We have to look comprehensively at the whole ecology in which we are embedded. Okay? So, remodel the culture, build the wellness ecology. And what is the wellness ecology? I don't know. But... I'd like to throw out some ideas over the next hour or so. So, if we start with plants, there's some really interesting research that I'd like to share with you. And, you know, plant communication and interconnection between plants and the natural world is a very large field. There's a lot we could cover, but I want to focus on a couple of specific things. And plants not using some kind of magical, mystical energy field. They may do that too. But, using very specific chemicals, much in the same way as we do, using neurotransmitters in our brain and central nervous system. And in fact, the chemicals that plants use to communicate with each other are very, very similar to the neurotransmitters we use to keep our own internal ecology connected. So there's this researcher by the name of Richard Carbon um, from UC Davis, University of California Davis, and he's actually an entomologist. We'll get back to that in just a second. But in the course 
plants and bugs work together, he found that in these sagebrush populations that he was monitoring in the southwest, there were these communications of volatile chemicals. You know, if you if you rub sagebrush, which is an artemisia, if any of you know mugwort, or even just little garden sage, different botanical family, but you rub those leaves, you get a smell, right? So you're breaking trichomes on the surface of the debris, volatile molecules, which travel through the air. And what Richard Carbon found is that those travel to neighboring plants can act as a way to send signals about the state of health of the neighbors and whether there's damage or threats or anything like that going on. Ted Farmer from the University of Luzon um, in Switzerland found that these chemicals bind to receptors on the surfaces of plant leaves and send a signal downstream into the stem of the plant and into what are called sieve elements to activate immune tissues in the plant far from the site where the chemical first interfaced with the leaf. And what's really interesting about these channels, we'll look at them in a second, is they, they look just like neurons. And they use the same exact mechanisms that neurons use to transmit a signal. They depolarize using voltage-gated channels that transmit sodium across a plasma membrane. Just exactly the same way our neurons work. We thought our neurons were special. Plants had them way before animals ever evolved. And they use these volatile chemicals to activate them and then activate their immunity and participate in the experience that their friends and relatives in the same growing environment are experiencing. So here's a picture of a sagebrush out in the southwestern desert. Um, and these are the plants that Richard um, Carbon was studying. This is a diagram of a depolarization wave that occurs when an insect browses a leaf. This is Ted Farmer's research, right? And you see the same, not only shape of the voltage spike, which comes from a fluxing of sodium ions across the plasma membrane of a cell, but you also see the same magnitude. It's about 50 millivolts, just as it is in human beings. Pretty incredible that plants are using volatile chemicals that smell to us like pine and camphor to communicate with each other, and then those chemicals elicit a depolarization wave through neuron-like structures in those plants themselves. But what is most fascinating to me is that Carbon found he imported some sagebrush from, like, Ohio into the Southwest. And they smell like, especially to the untrained nose, very similar. You know, really good smellers might be able to say like, oh, that's a little bit different of a smell from that sagebrush than from this one. But the sagebrushes in the Southwest knew exactly. They could differentiate which plants were secreting the chemicals. And they didn't listen to the ones from Ohio. They didn't care. To me, that's amazing. Richard Carbon says sagebrush <coughs> recognizes kin. Individuals that are more genetically related to it transmit signals more effectively than individuals that are not genetically related and initiate a protective response more effectively, which I think is really neat. So the sagebrush community in the Southwest was like, okay, I hear you, Ohio sagebrush, but I don't really care, <laughs> which I think is fascinating. They're building community too, just like we do. And interestingly, they're using a lot of the same mechanisms. So I won't necessarily bore you with the organic molecules that much, although I'm really into this stuff, right? Bionutrients and phytopharmacology. These are some um, botanical volatiles. Um, this is salicylic acid. Um, you know, methyl salicylate is wintergreen smell. Okay, this is thujone, which is like cedar, kind of camphor, also one of the main ingredients in absinthe. Um, for those of you who like to extract <laughs> plants. Um, catechol is another volatile from plants, okay? And this is dopamine, which some of you may know is a central nervous system neurotransmitter in our brain. It's involved in motor control and initiation. It's involved in reward, central nervous system reward pathways. That's one that gets a lot of focus and attention. So dopamine is a catechol amine. So it takes catechol, a botanical compound, and mammalian one as well, and attaches an amide group to it. That's really the only difference. And I had this Forgive my digression, but herbalists get into this stuff sometimes. I had this vision one time, sitting in the woods with plants, that this plant deva and spirit, who had been elaborating these volatile chemicals to talk to her neighbors, right, for hundreds of thousands of years, all of a sudden one day figured out how to get nitrogen from the air and attach it to these volatiles. And that's what an alkaloid is, right, you guys? Some of these 
botanical molecules that have the most profound effects on our system. They're catechols and volatiles like thujon to which a nitrogen has been attached. So our indole alkaloids that are similar to serotonin, for example. Anyway. <laughs> yes! You figured out how to get nitrogen out of the air, and now you can control animals, too. Because that's what plants are doing, right? We think we're in charge. I don't know if that's really true. Okay. So the similarity of these volatile chemicals that sagebrush uses to communicate and maintain kinship are very similar to the molecules our neurons use to communicate with each other. And in some cases, plants have actually figured out how to harness the very neurotransmitters we use and have all sorts of very interesting things happen in our body. Okay. It doesn't just stop with central nervous system neurotransmitters, though. A lot of the compounds that modulate our immune function are inflammatory balance, like prostaglandins. Bad name for a ubiquitous compound, first isolated in the prostate gland, so they were like, oh, we'll call it the prostaglandin, but it's everywhere in the body, right? But prostaglandin E2, which is a major important eicosanoid that modulates inflammation in human beings, is very similar to jasmonic acid. And jasmonic acid, what does it do in plants? Anyone run into this compound before? Partly involved in plant immunity and the recruiting of phytoalexins, which are plant defense compounds, and it's also partly involved in um, apical meristem and growth, right, in the plants. So just like prostaglandins modulate the recruitment of immune cells to a wound and also modulate the formation of granulation tissue in human wounds, jasmonic acid does very similar things in plants. So my point is similar to what Ted Farmer found, which is that we've got these deeply conserved functions that started in the botanical world and are maintained as communication systems and inflammation modulation systems and immune modulation systems in human beings. I think that's really neat. So the natural world communicates, clearly. All components are linked through conserved structures and similar signal molecules. And that's my contention, you guys. Bionutrients, these secondary plant metabolites we're talking about, they are signal molecules, not just between plants, but between plants and us. So that, to me, begs the question, we are kin with these plants, just as they are kin amongst themselves. We may not be as closely related as the sagebrushes are to each other, but we're still kin. So. Who's doing the signaling? What system are these signals linking together? Our neurotransmitters link our central nervous system and behavior pathways together. The volatiles link the sagebrush communities together. But once you see that these botanical bionutrients affect us medicinally, you start to say like, wow, a plant and a human might be part of the same system, and these chemicals may be linking these two pieces together in these really interesting ways. In ways we don't really think about, right? When we think of these plant chemicals, we tend to think of them as medicines. But I'm saying they're more than that. They're substances that knit together a broader organism, <clears throat> one that transcends both us and the plants. In order to understand this, I refer you to a philosopher of consciousness whose name is Alva Noe. I don't know if any of you have read any of his work, but really cool stuff. Um, the book that he wrote that really sort of drew me in is called Out of Our Heads, which is his exhortation for us to get out of our heads when we think about consciousness especially. So if there's this possibility that we've got signal molecules across kingdoms in the natural world and in an ecology, and that these signal molecules are, are knitting together some kind of larger organism, does that larger organism have consciousness? What the heck are we talking about here? Does it even exist? So Alva Noy rejects what's called the neural identity theory of consciousness, which is to say our brains are so complicated and there's so many neurons in there that an emergent property of consciousness comes out of that complexity, right? Um, you jam enough neurons together, you get consciousness. Any of you ever run into that idea? The idea that consciousness is identical to biology, right, and that is contained within a network of neurons is problematic for a range of reasons. One, for example, is how do you explain telepathy? 
If I've explained the fact that you have, telepathy is the wrong word, but sometimes you have the same thought your friend has at the exact same time. Or that the same experience will elicit the identical reaction between you and a person you love. I don't mean to burst anybody's bubble, but I don't really think it is telepathy. I think it's shared consciousness. And that's what Alba Noe tries to get us to think about. Non-local consciousness. Our consciousness may not be in our heads. At the very least, let's consider our bodies, too, as part of that, right? And the interplay between brain and heart and our internal organs in our brain. But if we're willing to go there and say that neurotransmitters link all that pieces, those pieces together, then we've got to be able to go further and say sagebrushers and humans might have some kind of interlinking, and me, wild crafting in the desert, might be part of one larger organism. These molecules keep us connected, knit us together. So the nesting of consciousnesses is a really interesting idea. When I have the same thought as my wife, or we have the same experience and my daughter and I react in the exact same way, or I think of my daughter at the exact same time she's thinking of me and we talk about it, it was like, oh yeah, it was 3.30. Like, we do that. I'm like, check your watch when you have a thought, and I'll check mine, and we'll talk about it at the end of the day. And it happens so often, right? It's not me and her telepathically communicating. It's our relationship having a thought. And it's happening at the same time through both of us. And the only reason that can happen is because we've built up shared experiences together over a long period of time, right? Does that make sense? But we can do that with plants and we can do that with an ecology too. And if that's the case, then we have to kind of say, well, James Lovelock and Lynn Margulis, the planetary atmospheric scientist and the microbiologist who coined the term Gaia hypothesis, were right. The planet is conscious. It's a living, breathing system. I think this is undeniable. The interesting corollary to that is that the planet is conscious, so is the solar system. If the solar system is conscious, well, then probably the galaxy is too. And I don't know what that thing at the middle of the galaxy, supermassive black hole, like, whoa. Maybe we get access to that consciousness from time to time. Maybe people call it things like spirit or God. I don't know. But the real interesting point is, think about microbiome. Think about our guts, right? And all the bacteria and flora and fauna that live in there. They're down there being like, wow, if, if the E. coli and, and the salmonella and I all have a relationship, then maybe we're part of a broader organism, and, and maybe it has consciousness too. <laughs> but if any of you have studied the microbiome, you know that it affects our moods in profound ways, right? So that leads us to my final thing, right? Not all fate is fixed. Not, life is not determined. God is not, like, planning things for us down to the every last detail, I don't think. But not all will is free, either. We may think we're having a thought, but it might be people in our lives and the relationships that we have with them that are thinking through us. It might be bacteria inside us and the relationship we have with them that are thinking through us. So again, exploding this idea that consciousness is local and it's identical to our neurons. Setting that aside, opens up a lot of possibilities in terms of why we might be having the types of experiences we're having. Okay? And so if you go up to like the consciousness of the solar system, consciousness of the solar system is not in charge of our life. We have a little bit of self-determination. And it also doesn't have entirely free will. The decisions we make impact it. And this is really important when we're thinking about things like climate change, for example. Gaia is not all-powerful. Her will is partly governed by what we do. Similarly, our fate is governed by what she does. Does that make sense? This is a very sort of Scandinavian Germanic concept, right? Um, if you read about the mythology around Yggdrasil and Thor, and you'll, you'll see that they're somewhat fatalistic, and free will is an interesting and flexible concept in those types of mythologies, but I really think they had a point. So, I think when we're talking about wellness ecology, we're talking about wellness of this organism that we are embedded in. How can we help it get better, get stronger, be more well, so that we also can experience better, stronger wellness in our own personal lives? The same thing Mongoya sees, right? That's why traditional healing systems see this, because they recognize that we're all embedded in organisms that are larger than we are. 
just like the gut flora is embedded inside us. Okay. Well, we know a few ways to do this, right? Um, we can look at connections between us and the world around us. We can also look at connections between us and the world inside us. So when looking at connections between us and the world around us, you know, people have been studying how nice it is to garden and how good it is for our spirits for a really long time. We now have meta-analyses, which means studies have been statistically analyzed and populations have been lumped together. We clearly see that gardening reduces stress and anxiety, reduces depression, makes people feel better. It works a lot better if you don't wear gloves, just by the way. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Now that said, sometimes you practically you do need to wear gloves. But I really do encourage you to just get actual dirt on your hands from time to time. Probably this is not the audience will have to make that exhortation. Right? Um, so, you know, all the way we see that mental health interventions in gardening are great. We also have seen in um, more recent meta-reviews that it's not just mental health, it's also inflammatory conditions. Because, of course, mental health and inflammatory conditions are linked inside of us. And gardening helps. Now, what Stafford Lightman has been studying for a long time um, is bacteria. So he's really a microbiologist, and um, he studies like tuberculosis and other types of mycobacteria, right? So he ran into this cousin of tuberculosis that is totally harmless, called Mycobacterium vaccae, that is found in the soil. And he found that Mycobacterium vaccae, when we get it on our hands, and we pick our nose, or we put our hands in our mouth, it gets into our mucous membranes, and it affects what he calls the mesolimbocortical system. So midbrain, limbic system, cortex. These bacteria elute chemicals that affect the serotonin pathways in these important mood balancing association areas of the brain. The limbic system takes our memory, right, from the frontal lobes, prefrontal cortex, and it helps us develop our personality and our reactions to the world. And Mycobacterium vaccae, when we get it into our body, interfaces with that and messes with it, apparently in a really beneficial way. <coughs> But what's neat to know is that if you compare the bacterial populations in soil from a conventional farm to the bacterial populations in living, growing organic soil, there's no comparison. Farm fields that are treated with synthetic chemicals are basically sterile. So you see these corn fields? They're sterile. It's, again, I don't have to tell you guys that. But living, breathing soil contains bacterial populations that aren't just good for the plants and for the resilience of the garden and the farm. They're also amazingly good for us when we interface with them. Okay? Um, Maya Shetreet Klein is a pediatric neurologist. She wrote this book called The Dirt Cure, which is an interesting book. Um, it maybe is a little longer than it needs to be because the basic premise is simple. She works with kids who have attention issues, right, or personality quote unquote disorders, and she basically gets them dirty as part of her therapy. And lo and behold, their moods improve, their attention improves, they can sit inside boxes at desks for longer periods of time. This is unnatural business, but we're adaptable beings. We can handle a wide range of operating conditions, right? Including sitting in a weird box at desks for long periods of time. But we do it a lot better if we're connected to these things that we've been connected to for a really, really long time. It's like the super organism in which we're embedded is saying, come back, right? be a part of me again, I miss you. And what's interesting is that when we're not a part of it, our brains start making really weird decisions. Mm -hmm. And we see things like spilling billions of gallons of oil into the Gulf of Mexico, and we we're like, ah, yeah, it's bad, but oh well. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. Which is just insane. And any traditional culture would look at that and be like, holy cow. we got to totally change our strategy because this is killing our shared environment, right? Okay. Richard Louvre, last child in the woods, coined this thing called nature deficit disorder because he didn't like saying that kids had attention deficit disorder. One of the quotes that really stuck with me from our book is he interviewed a bunch of kids, right? And they say, um, he said, why don't you go outside? Or like, what, what's keeping you from going outside? And the kids were like, well, why would I ever play outside? There are no outlets. That's where we're at, right? But anyway, um, the point is that the more high-tech we become, there's nothing wrong with having outlets. 
<clears throat> playing with really cool tools. But we need nature in order to do that. In no way, you guys, am I advocating for us to kind of return back to some idyllic time when we all lived in the woods and foraged for plants. First of all, it wasn't idyllic. Second of all, it's not practical, and I really do believe in human progress. But I think human progress only works effectively, and we'll see why this is in just a second, if we maintain connection to the roots from which we evolved. Quite literally, the roots. Okay? Um, this is the work of Dr. Andrea um, Faber-Taylor, and you know the study that she put out that made a lot of impact a few years ago was that um, a one-hour walk in an urban park, it doesn't have to be in the forest, is equivalent to a dose of Ritalin for kids. Now, that's great, and we can all say like, yes, but there's a problem. If I'm going to take my daughter for a one-hour walk in the park, that's one hour of email that I'm not doing. My productivity is going down. But in the end, you guys, if my daughter is having like a hypoglycemic and attention crisis at the end of the day because no one went for a walk in her, with her in the park and like sat down and ate some apples, my productivity will be even more greatly hampered and impaired. So taking that one hour out of my day to give both of us medicine might seem counterproductive in the short term because we're so geared on like the cult of the individual, right? But if we can just take a moment and subsume our individual desire, the thing that's right in front of our face for the good of our community, and in this case, my family, we end up actually becoming stronger, more resilient, happier, and healthier. Our family is more well. Does that make sense? So the drug-like mentality of take Ritalin stands in opposition to the traditional mentality, which says, well, if you're feeling bad, connect to the source. Go back to the mater. But you might take a little effort in the short term. You might have to subsume your individual desires, but in the end, everyone will be happier and healthier. <coughs> so the, in Japan, they call it forest bathing. And I first got turned on to forest bathing in like 2011, 2012. Now a lot of people are talking about it, which I think is great. Doesn't mean you have to take your bath to bath to the woods. It means you just go to the woods and you take in the smell and the sights and the sounds and the light. And all the multisensory experience is incredibly healing to us, just the same way gardening is. Okay. The last piece I want us to think about is what's called the hygiene hypothesis, and it basically says um, open sewers not so great, cycle sand on every surface not so great. The good thing is somewhere in between. We took this idea of basic hygiene and we took it too far, right? And as a result, we're starting to see autoimmune disease and allergy increase. And it is perhaps because the immune system has not been trained to engage, because the immune system is this amazing information processing system, right? Really good at reading and making decisions. It hasn't been trained to do that because we just sterilize our environments so dramatically. And if we can get kids, but also adults, back into dirty environments, mycobacteria and black case starts affecting our mood and our brain. We see less attention deficit, irritability, anxiety, nervousness. The community and the ecology feel better. So again, we come back to this idea of like we're zeroing in on this wellness ecology. It involves us being connected to the things that humans do well, our phones, our computers, all that stuff. But it also involves connecting to something that is still not totally clear about this source, this creative matrix, right? That is embedded in the ecology and that the ecology seems connected to, but we still haven't like totally related to 100%. I just wanna say it's not as simple as just nature, I don't think, okay? And in some cases, nature is actually dangerous or scary. And in some urban environments and folks that I've, with folks that I've worked with, saying like, oh, just take your kid for a walk out in the park. I'm like, ooh, nuts. Seriously. Now, we can change that. We can hopefully try to work on changing that. But it's more than just nature, I think. So I'll get to that in just a moment. I just want to spend a second talking about our internal ecology as well. This is an amazing picture of our, um, the border between the bacteria in our intestines, the mucus layer, and then our actual intestinal mucous membrane cells. And this was published in Cell, a couple of the magazines, <coughs> Cell, a couple of years ago. It's just amazing to me how they explain this. And 
how beautiful it is. So there's this mucus layer that the bacteria feed on. We really want to make sure it's there to protect our gut cells, right? If this mucus layer breaks down, or if we don't have adequate soluble fiber, it can affect inflammatory compounds in our gut mucus membrane, and there's a range of downstream things that can occur there, right? I also study bitter compounds in plants a lot. I'm very fascinated by how bitters sort of activate not just our digestion, but also our immune system, right? So these folks are at um, UPenn, um, Robert Lee and Noam Cohen, and they're finding bitter taste receptors in our nose and airways, which is just bizarre, because we're not trying to like taste absinthe in our nose. Please don't do that. But what we find is that bacterial populations, there's this mucus layer in there, right? And this is true in the GI tract as well. And that mucus layer has sugar in it as part of it. As bacterial populations increase and sugar levels go down, bacteria start to produce basically poop, bacterial enterotoxins, and other molecules which taste really bitter or activate our bitter taste receptors. That stimulates an immune response right there in the local tissue that knocks back the bacterial populations. Conversely, as glucose levels go up, you see a suppression of that immune function. So bitter taste receptors are involved in like protecting us and detecting what those bacteria are up to that live inside us and helping like create a sort of stable homeostatic balance with the flora that lives in our nose, in our airway, in our gut. Okay? It's interesting that we've completely eliminated most bitter tasting things from our diet. And I think we see, unfortunately, some consequences as a result. Um, I could go into that a lot more, but that's a topic for another day. Um, Eva Selhub is an MD at Harvard, and she worked with Alan Logan. Um, and Allison Bested in a really great review of mental health and gut connections. This is available free full text. It's in three parts. I really encourage you to check it out if you're interested in that sort of thing. And what's interesting is that at the sort of beginning of the 20th century, Eli Metchkinoff, who was sort of the grandfathers of microbiology, right, was basically on this train called auto-intoxication. Mental health, they said, was because the gut barrier is broken down and we're polluting ourselves with bacterial endotoxins, which are messing with our mind. After 30, 40, 50 years through the 50s and 60s, that changed, right? And it was all about the central nervous system. You've got a chemical imbalance in your central nervous system. That's why you have spirit sickness or mental health disturbance. And conversely, if you've got mental health issues, it's kind of like your fault. It was in your brain. If you could just change your brain, then you could be better. What the heck's wrong with you? Which we don't say for any other disease, by the way, but whatever. <laughs> now we're starting to see that it's a combination of both. There may be some chemical differences between people's brains, for sure. But this idea that the gut barrier breaks down because of dietary or floral imbalances or patterns, it has a lot to do with what our mood is on a day-to-day -day basis. Right? So, eating fermented foods, helping to eat more soluble fiber, like which a lot of things like Jerusalem artichoke and burdock root contain, right? And nurturing our gut flora is a great way to kind of support good mental health as well. So, the wellness ecology isn't just outside of us, it's inside of us too. And we have a lot of techniques to help adjust our gastrointestinal mucous membrane layer build good gut flora inside of us, which then ends up affecting our spirit sickness. We also have these techniques outside of us, right? Like going for a walk, doing some forest bathing, gardening and getting bacteria on our hands, being less hygienic. Now they're starting to do these studies of like, don't ever shower, and how it affects your mood. I'm serious. It was in the New York Times. Like people are now not showering for months at a time and seeing how it affects their mood. And, you know, I feel for their friends and family, but the, the take-home is that it makes them better. They feel better. Okay, there's a sweet spot in there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> so we come back to Richard Carbon. I told you he was an entomologist before he started looking at those sagebrushes. And he has 25 years of data, which you can browse, about woolly bear caterpillars and the types of plants they consume. And wouldn't you know, what he found is that there's these parasites of woolly bear caterpillars called tachinid flies. They're like little wasp lights, basically. They get inside there, and they grow, and they pupate, and then they become adults, and they emerge out of the caterpillar. And like 60, 70% of the time, kill the caterpillar when they emerge. 
Okay? So not ideal. About 80% of the caterpillars who are not infected live to adulthood. About 30 to 40% if they're infected live to adulthood to be able to reproduce. But what Richard Carbon found is that when they're infected, they go from browsing on lupins and clover to browsing on poison hemlock and plants like forage that are rich in pyrolizidine alkaloids. They shift their pattern of behavior, or what's called their phenotype, right? They all have the same genotype, but they shift their phenotype in response to infection. It's like these caterpillars are herbalists. <laughs> but that's really bizarre, right? So what's going on there? We always thought, like, how did human beings learn to use echinacea? They observed animals. No. This is genetically innate. It is in us, in insects. Insects alter their behavior when they're infected, when they're sick, to use different types of forage crops in order to deal with that infection. And when they browse on poison hemlock or on pyrolizidine rich plants, 60 to 70% of them survive to adulthood, even if they're infected. Not as many, but way better than the 30 to 40%. It seems like a smart intervention on their part. So this idea that we can exhibit different phenotypes, right, depending on different environmental conditions, is called phenotypic plasticity. And it's the same genome. Woolly bears are always the same. But if they're infected, they browse on poisonous plants. If they're not infected, they browse on lupin and clover. The instructions for those two different browsing patterns are contained in a flexible genotype. And the same is true for us, right? Our genes encode a range of different possibilities for us in terms of how those genes will become expressed on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, right? Our will isn't completely free there, but it's also not, our fate is not completely fixed by our genome, okay? Primates, this guy Michael Huffman from Kyoto, studied primate self-medication behavior, again, for more than 20 years, and really, really fascinating stuff. Primates will get specific plants which they will remove the outer peel from to find the bitter pith, vernonia in particular in this example, in order to clear parasitic infections that happen only during certain periods of the year. They know where to find those plants, they know how to prepare them, they don't just eat them. And only the sick individuals do it. They have wild crafting skills, they have pharmacy skills, and they have diagnosis skills. But apparently so do the woolly bears, which to me is just incredible. Those skills are encoded in phenotypic plasticity. Our genome contains a range of different instructions, including instructions on what kind of plants to browse when we feel different types of illness. Now, the primates are lucky because they also have culture as another layer on top of that. So we see adult individuals train younger individuals about where to go to find the vernonia. The woolly bears don't have that. Aside, maybe like there are no wise old caterpillars. You know? <laughs> Aside from underlying. <laughs> so, plasticity encodes our ancestral experience. All the co-evolutionary relationships we've had with the diseases and the infections in our past, and with the medicines in our past, they're encoded in our genome, you guys. The evidence is there. But in order to use that information, optimizing the plastic response requires adequate signal diversity from within and without. So what does that mean? If you don't use it, the tools that are encoded in your genome, you lose it. And in fact, this thing called canalization occurs, where the plastic response becomes less and less broad. And the choices available to an organism become fewer and fewer. I think we run the risk of doing this as human beings. We're not there yet, but we have dramatically reduced the signal diversity in our lives. Okay? We have. 80% of our calories come from like eight species now. Okay, some of them genetically modified. Bionutrient utilization is an innate skill and it is specific and refined. This is, seems obvious, but I think it bears repeating. Herbal medicine, the use of plants to treat disease and to maintain wellness is built into our genome from the woolly bear caterpillars on up the evolutionary tree. Yeah. Is, is plastic response similar to the epidemic switching on on So plastic response is, is the is the outcome and epigenetics is part of how that is achieved. 
So the epigenetic mechanisms are the ones that will turn on or off certain genes depending on the environmental signals. And that's why we see these botanical phytonutrients, right, affecting epigenetic mechanisms, like histone acetylation and deacetylation or methylation, right, sulfur compounds from garlic and broccoli. But if we don't taste that stuff, if we don't put it into our bodies, it doesn't matter what kind of wisdom is encoded in our genome, we won't have access to it, okay? So we have to support high signal diversity and availability. We have to build the wellness ecology. Okay, so how do we do that? We don't do that by cultivating monocropping. Does that make sense? We can't do that because that's not diverse. That farm field is not well, and it doesn't give us any of the signals we need to be well and to modulate our phenotypic response in the face of the insanity that is 21st century Western culture. I think we can handle it, but we can't handle it alone. And that's what we've seen when evolutionary biologists study the plasticity of the phenotypic response in environments that are 100% novel, that lack any ancestral connection. Usually the outcome is extinction. That might not be the worst thing for Gaia, but I like humans. And in order to avoid that, or to avoid genetic canalization that will dramatically restrict our options, we need to maintain this high signal diversity and availability. So how do we do that? What is this business? What is it inside this that can serve as a cue or indicator that we're working in the right direction towards building the wellness ecology? Michael McCarthy wrote this great book called The Moth Snowstorm. And this is an example of a moth snowstorm. He bemoans the lack of moth snowstorms. When he was a kid, driving home sometimes at night in England, there were so many moths in the headlights and on his windshield that they had to stop the car because they couldn't see. I've never seen that. It's like our insect population is dying. And he uses it as a beginning to kind of say, like, our world is in trouble, which we kind of know. The Anthropocene has not been kind to the guy. Now that said, his idea is joy might be the ticket to help bring it back. Because everyone who goes out in nature feels joy. And that goes back to what Marian Whitman was saying. That goes back to what traditions, traditional indigenous cultures say, right? You go back out there, you experience this something as part of the wellness ecology, you feel joy, you feel re-inspired, you feel ready to go do it again inside the cubicle. So what is it in nature? that gives us this joy. Certainly, we experience it through connection with the chemicals we've talked about. Certainly, we experience it through just being in the presence. But like, what's similar about these works of human art, right? Clouds, the classic wave. You can't see Mount Fuji, but it's like over here, right? M.C. Escher. Anyone know this one? Paula? Yeah, it's a painting called Alchemy by Jackson Paula. So what's similar about these things? What's similar about music? This stuff, when I look at it, makes me feel kind of similar to what I feel when I go out in the woods. When I listen to amazing musical pieces, sometimes I feel that too. Sometimes I look at a building, right? And buildings are incredible sometimes. Sometimes they're not. But sometimes they're really amazing. This is a train station in Lisbon, Portugal. And just something feels nice about that. I don't quite know what it is. Well, I do. <laughs> and so what people have looked at, and it started with Jackson Pollock, Richard Taylor at the University of Oregon started mapping out what appeared to be random paint splotches through the 40s and into the 50s in Pollock's work. And what he found is that Pollock's work started exhibiting what he calls fractal dimensionality. And I'm not going to go into like exactly what that means or how we calculate that. Suffice it to say that a fractal dimensionality of about 1.4, 1.5 is what we see in this picture. And when his work hit this, the critics were like, whoa, this is good stuff. But they didn't do that until that time. Once Pollock started, and he wasn't like mathematically calculating this business out, he just had tapped into this flow, right? That then expressed itself in his work. And it's the same flow that you see in the best human art, in the best human music. Sometimes when I write, I feel it. I'm sure you all have experienced it. So that feeling of flow and feeling of being in the right place at the right time and feeling like super creative and connected, right? It seems to be linked to fractal dimensionality and the experience of this mathematical construct that we now have been able to identify. So um, 
Ari Goldberger has seen this, so this is a, a very typical example of like dendritic branching, right? Which we see in neurons, which we see in river deltas, which we see in trees. It's self-similar, right? This little piece looks like this, this little piece looks like this, and on down infinitely. The heart rate variability patterns show similar self-similarity. 300 minutes, 30 minutes, 3 minutes. EKG processes and EEG processes have been mapped, mapped out by Ari Goldberger and has found that these patterns of variability exhibit fractal dimensionality, just the same way as Pollock's work of about 1.4, 1.5. River deltas, trees, when I look at an acacia tree and it feels nice, when I look at the Lisbon train station and it feels nice, they all have similar fractal dimensionality. Very fascinating to me. But of course, those who have looked at sacred geometry or understand the golden ratio realize that the resonance that we see across the universe in all of these structures are connected to the same thing. And it's not something magical or special. It's just that the universe evolved that way. And all of the organisms evolved in the same way and co-evolved in these nested consciousnesses, right? So they just look similar because they're all similar, because they're all one thing, right? And when we reconnect to that, that's when we feel good. That's when we feel less friction. Let me give you one last example. This is the process of how we look at things. When we look at things, we don't just look at things. Our eyes do this thing called microsaccades, which means like we'll go like this, then we'll go like this, then this, then this, and then we'll do it in the next place. And the pattern of movement of our eyes through a field exhibits fractional dimensionality of about 1.4, 1.5. You know, you can look at Martin Rolf's work. So basically, when we look at an acacia tree or when we look at the Jackson Pollock work, it feels comfortable to us. It feels like home because that's how our eyes are used to looking at things. Nature always feels that way because nature evolved in the same way as our vision evolved. So of course it feels comfortable. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We really are embedded in this big organism that we're an inextricable part of, and it makes our life a heck of a lot easier if we go with that flow, instead of trying to fight against it. And we're super smart, right? We're like little kids at Christmas who are like, I got my new toy, I'm gonna play with it, I don't care what anybody else says. Our toy is technology, and we, we're really good with it. But we need to remember that we're also embedded in this system. And for us to feel comfortable and alive and well, we need to honor the fractal dimensionality that, that is at the root of it. And we can think about different ways to build buildings. We can think about different ways to tell stories. We can think about different ways to make music. We can think about different ways to take medicine and garden. And when you look, like, because again, this is the perfect example. Plant makes food. Let's grow all this plant in a square, because machine likes the square. Okay, that's fine, but it's a really immature understanding of where we are in this context. A garden that is very diverse, that appears to be less productive, right? It's actually more productive, feels better, and yields more of those signal molecules that are so important for us to maintain our individual wellness. Does that make sense? Again, we become obsessed with the stuff, the carbohydrates, the protein, and fat. That stuff is never going to reconnect us to the source of creativity. That comes from all the correct chemical signals, all the bionutrients that are not primary metabolites. And so, again, we've all heard the adage that we are very well fed, but very poorly nourished. And that is, I think, a really good way to summarize what's going on in Western culture. But we can get back to that nourishment by sacrificing a little bit of the efficiency, the perfection, the yield. And in the end, we'll be a lot healthier for it. So, structures and processes that emphasize the wellness ecology bring us joy. Because the wellness ecology is the source of joy and creativity. Resonance with these broadly conserved patterns that we've seen between plants, between plants and people, they can be mathematically described. They exist at every level of reality. It is undeniable. When we resonate with that business, it removes friction, it increases efficiency, it just makes us feel good. Okay? And so we should support resident art, cities, farms, and medicines. And that's how we can build the wellness ecology. So how do we get to it? I humbly say that herbal medicine 
is one of those things. We lack that cohesive unifying myth. We're struggling with this idea that individual wellness should be subsumed to collective wellness, or that we at least need to start thinking about communities as a whole instead of just individuals, and how all those members of the community are doing if we are going to be healthy. And people are struggling with how to figure that out. I love this picture. It's like in the middle of downtown. It's like forging in the bushes. That's great. If it has to start there, that's great. But we should put huge, fractally arranged swaths of greenery in every green environment in every city that we have, right? And we're moving in that direction. We really are. Because of folks like you and organizations like this. Oops. But herbal medicine, I think, this is my friend Deb Soul in her garden, Avena Botanicals in Maine, if you ever get a chance to visit, it's amazing. Decentralized. Fractals are not centralized. They're self-similar. Very, very diverse. Mutually supportive. Grassroots. Imperfect. In the kitchen. Ecological. It ticks off all of the markers. Plus, the botanicals we use in herbal medicine are unhybridized. They haven't been genetically modified. Their phytonutrient density is incredibly high because Monsanto has not tried to modify the dandelion yet. I don't put it past them. But I think the dandelion will work. <laughs> the thing to remember when we're doing this, though, is that herbalism is not a thing. It's not stuff. This connection to these plants that are wild, that have been part of our history since we were woolly bears, it's not about getting it, isolating it, and taking it in pill form. That's why this stuff really upsets me. Okay? It's much better to just plant a lemon balm plant on your windowsill and smell it every day than to do anything like this. Does that make sense? You're connecting to a living being. That's what really, I think, ultimately makes the difference. Okay? So, our wellness ecology, the concepts that we've looked at, High biodiversity allows us to have maximum plasticity to weather environmental change in the most graceful possible way because we have the signals to affect the epigenetic mechanisms that allow that plasticity to find the right track at any given moment. High bionutrients are required because that's how we get that high biodiversity of signals. We need a lot of these secondary plant metabolites. And not just plant metabolites, <laughs> mushroom metabolites as well, bacterial metabolites as well. Okay? Daily practice. No pill is going to encapsulate this for us, despite the fact that now they're doing fecal transplants through oral pills, right? Which I think is great, by the way. I think it's going to be a lot more comfortable. But that's not the solution. <laughs> okay? We can't take a plant's life and put it into a pill for ourselves. It has to be part of a daily practice. And that means leaving some weeds in your garden, I think. I think that's part of it. Right? And then remembering that the ecology's health is the individual's health. There's no separation there. And then if we get into these daily practices that nurture our individual health, bi-directional activity will begin to change our ecological health. I've seen this case by case in clinic, right? When a guy comes back to me and says, you know that deadline tincture, like, I'm just not gassy anymore. I never realized how gassy I was. Good for you. But he says, and maybe I won't really spray Roundup on them anymore. <laughs> it's bi-directional, right? Herbalism changes your mind in this really interesting way because it connects you to other living beings that are embedded in this broader living being that we're an inextricable part of. Okay? So, again, I know this is like soil science, nutrient optimization, bio-nutrient optimization in food crops, but I will say herbal medicine should be a part of that too. Um, you can plant buffers in your gardens that have wild weeds in them and medicinal plants in them. It helps your garden. It might slightly reduce your yield, but it does change the microbial communities in your soil, and it does improve the overall bio-nutrient density of you eat, that bionutrient density is essential for our individual health, but also for ecological health. And if we're going to weather the Anthropocene, Gaia needs us to do this, right? It needs us to connect back into the stream. That is really the true source of life, the true mantra, as Marion Woodman puts it. Right. Mm -hmm.
We do have 20 minutes, so if oh, really? you wanted, uh, yes, uh, quarter till is when uh, oh, it's scheduled, I, I don't think. Know why I, huh? Oh, geez, well, I, I rushed really quickly. Let's talk some more. <laughs> this is great. 445, it says. Yeah. So, please, do you have any questions? <laughs> I, I'd like to share that um, if anyone's feeling some plant and spirit sickness, um, I just returned from Costa Rica where the world's first medically supervised plant medicine retreat was offering four days of ayahuasca ceremony that really helped open my heart and, and uh, heal my spirit sickness. And so, uh, yeah, it's called Rhythmia. So, if you don't mind, that brings up this idea of the theogenic plants. Right. Um, which is, goes back to that whole sort of vision I had with the flower deva. Um, and I was just, you know, gardening at the time and um, using no intoxicating plants whatsoever. But that's really one of the major things they've got is these, the indole alkaloid plants, um, which lead to things like DMT, for example, or ibogaine, um, or psilocybin. All of these molecules are basically serotonin-like substances that have profound effects on our central nervous system and are also included particularly in initiation rituals in traditional cultures, which is something that our society really sorely lacks. And one of the things I didn't really talk about that I think is really important to think about is that um, no, no one ever asks us to take responsibility for being grown up. One of the things that the Maasai do is, you know, we can argue about these initiation rituals because some of them I think I have real big problems with. It's not my job to tell them to change their initiation or whatever. Um, but that's the time that you go from being a child who was like all about you to becoming a part of the community formally, which means, sorry sucker, it's not about you 100% anymore. It has to be part of the community now. You have important work to do for the community, which means that you need to flex your individual desires for the good of the community. That's what initiation rituals are designed to do for us. So no one in this culture takes that kind of responsibility at age 13, 14, 15. And what entheogens seem to be able to do for us is help with that process by helping us let go of our own me, 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 me. Right? idea that you know there's a fat herb of the day that you're going to um, you know sell lots of and it really speaks to I think what are echoes of drug like mentality right because we're really used to this idea again of turning over our personal responsibility for our health because it's a pain in the butt to make tea and even more to like grow the plants to make the tea right holy cow who has the time for that well I'm telling you if you can make the time for that they heal you in ways other than the cup of tea right I mean, other really profound ways that we looked at but I think the point is that it's it's an expression of the interface with of a traditional technology like herbal medicine in a modern context that is very used to like this for that. And it's difficult to wrap your mind around a messy cocktail of things, or that one plant might be able to do this in one day for you, but do a different thing in another day for you, depending on what's going on in your life. People want a little more clarity and certainty, and having a single species is much more helpful in that regard. Um, I even got into arguments with the Food and Drug Administration, who, you know, is trying to tell me that I need to be able to chemically analyze a complex of multiple different herbs in a formula. And I tell them, well, both the elderberry and the echinacea have our aminogalactins in them. They're both going to come out of HPLC in the same spike. So how can I tell you which plant eluded that chemical? And they're like, well, maybe you need to make your formulas simpler. 
<laughs> no. um, maybe we need to think about a different way of doing things. So my ultimate point is, when people say like you got to have the the ultra expensive Tibetan goji berry if you want adequate antioxidant effect in your body, I tell them blueberries. You know, the plants that are growing locally in your local environment are going to be much more appropriate for you than any like super expensive multi-level marketing goji juice, right? Because they're breathing the same air, drinking the same water, and embedded in the same soil that you are on a day-to-day -day basis. So you're all part of this wellness ecology together, right? And that's also why I really favor the weedy plants way more than the fancy ones that are really expensive because they've particularly been the ones that like human waste places. You know, where do dandelions grow? Where does plantain grow? It grows where human beings step. Red clover and yarrow, they don't really like it if you leave the fields totally wild. They like a mowing, maybe once or twice a season. Then they really thrive. Again, we co-evolved together for a really long time. So, I don't know. To answer your question, I think that um, you can't do anything with one herb. You can do a lot of different things with one herb, but it's never going to be like the solution. It's a silver bullet mentality that I think comes from our 100-year-old stint with pharmaceuticals. Right? Traditional cultures don't look at plant medicine that way. They do look at some specific plants, for sure, but they always look at a daily tonification regime that comes from weedy plants that grow on their own right around your local environment. So one of the things that we do every spring um, and fall is we clean up our garden, right? We get things started. Um, if you're pulling dandelions out of your garden, don't throw them away. Leave some, make some into extracts, dry them. Think about using the weeds in your garden that come up that you normally discard as plant medicine. The weeds are going to be much more phytonutrient dense than any crop, pretty much, that you can grow. Because they're working hard, they're really strong fighters, and they exhibit a lot of this really rich chemistry in order to be able to do that. And then think about um, maybe even planting some little, I mean, I always call them buffer zones or pollinator zones in your garden. Um, not only to serve as sort of sinks for potential pests, right? but also to um, affect the community around the rhizosphere, which we know botanicals do really well. Um, there's a range of plants from calendula, right, um, through red clover, and even purslane that can be planted or left in the garden, um, have medicinal effects, and also help the garden. Even if you don't use them yourself, just to have them in there as part of the garden. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but I'm not, I'm not into monopopularization of herbs. I think it's a little bit of a, of a perversion of the traditional system. I think that's all I wanted to hear is that you also have a revelation for I mean, the woolly bears will go for a range of different toxic plants, not just the one specific, Conium Makalana. Yeah. yeah. I think you have um, some thoughts on comfrey. Um, we know forever the most one out there and all of a sudden it got vilified and you know what are your feelings about its safety? Because so, people ask me that all the time. I use comfrey a lot. Yeah, comfrey is super safe topically. There's no problem with using it that way. Um, but one of the reasons it got into trouble is it contains some of these alkaloids that the woolly bears were looking for, which are called pilolizidine alkaloids. They've been linked with veno occlusive disease, which um, basically means causing liver damage and, and preventing the liver from functioning properly and, and eventually leading to profound toxicity in humans. Not comfrey though. Pterolizidine alkaloids from other plants like ragwort, which is Senecio genus, one of the ones that is richest in those particular alkaloids. You shouldn't use ragwort medicinally. Um, it's like bad for the liver, it really is. Comfrey, it's even debatable whether it contains pterolizidine alkaloids. <laughs> and the leaves, if they do contain any, have just trace quantities. And it may not be the American comfrey with the purple flowers, it may just be the Russian comfrey with green colored flowers that actually contains pyrolizidine alkaloids in its leaves. Its roots might be a different story, there might be a little more. But if you're not using comfrey, you shouldn't use borage either, right? Or bud loss, all of which are boraginaceae, or lungwort, boraginaceae, all contain traces of pyrolizidine alkaloids. So my usual party line comment on comfrey and the pyrolizidine alkaloids is, don't give it to um, in high quantities to pregnant moms or to nursing moms with infants. Don't give it to children who are under maybe two or three years of age um, for any kind of prolonged period of time. 
And if you're an adult with liver disease, think about whether you want to use it or not, or using a different plant might be better. Well, what would you say, what would be the reasons to use it internally? Oh, um, I love comfrey root um, as part of a gastrointestinal mucous membrane healing protocol. So a lot of times, particularly if people get really bloated from starches, and there might be a concern about a, an overgrowth of bacteria in the upper part of their GI tract, um, I'll use a lot of golden seal and sometimes wormwood to kind of knock back those bacterial populations at first, and then use a lot of fermented food and maybe even some probiotics um, to restore, but at the same time use um, prebiotic starches from comfort root, burdock root, and slippery owl, um, and a lot of comfort root to stimulate proliferation of the gastrointestinal mucous membrane layer, so that it kind of repairs itself and grows. Comfrey contains allantoin, which is an important cell proliferant, um, so the gut mucous membrane will heal more quickly in the presence of comfrey, which is also why it's really good on the skin, um, to help heal skin. How about the leaf? Yeah, the leaf is similar. The root is just a little slimier and more soothing, um, but the leaf is similar. Um, I wouldn't use it for more than like two or three weeks at a time, just to be totally on the safe side. But comfrey, um, I think, is unfairly maligned. I think so. I mean, all of our animals love it. So yeah. I think they Right. And multiple pregnant women throughout history have consumed massive quantities of it daily. And it never caused any fetal distress. Um, as far as I can tell, there's no, nothing in the literature when I've looked at um, in terms of fetal distress from comfrey ingestion during pregnancy. So I really just give you that party line out of an abundance of caution. Yeah. Yeah. I want to thank you for bringing up the signal molecules and the other um, really bitter and uh, diverse flavors of the other foods. I think that's what the Biology Association is looking at in what nutrient density will mean for health and um, quality food in the future. Um, and I also want to um, bring up, I thought something was missing in your talk was uh, the role of fat that our omnivorous bodies plays, and um, especially given that agriculture is actually relatively new on the planet. Um, when you look at what the long-term cycles and rhythms you're talking about are in ecology, um, paleological uh, food sources would have been much more animal-based for humans. Yes and no. Um, I mean, when we got animals, we were psyched, but I don't know if it was always necessarily a daily part of our diet, right? Well, years ago, years if we were lucky, but we weren't necessarily always lucky, and we certainly went through feast and famine periods, um, particularly in, in environments like the African savanna, right? When during certain periods of the year, finding meat was really tough. If so, you include insects, you could find meat mm -hmm. all the time. Right. Now, I, what I don't think we really ever ate a lot of was carbohydrates. We would get carbohydrates from some tubers and maybe some grass seeds, right, but not a lot. And then we would get meat and eat it and preserve it when we could, but it wasn't, I don't know, necessarily always a staple um, every single day. I would refer you to the work of Christina Warriner, who is an um, archaeogeneticist and has, you know, looked at residues um, in excavated human remains to attempt to assess what their diet was like. And yes, they definitely, lots of meat and lots of fat and like eating brain and definitely getting all that good stuff. It's so important to us. But what they had a ton of was foraged plants, crazy wild foraged plants all the time. And animals are great and fat is really important, particularly in modulating inflammatory balance and helping with mental health. I completely um, agree with you on that. And our fat phobia has been an incredible disservice over the last 50 or 60 years. Um, but really, animals don't give us a ton of signal molecules in their program. <coughs> Specifically, the fat signal yeah. and how it affects um, cytokine storms in the brain. Yeah, and, and echosinoid formation and all of that. Yeah, I completely agree. And the other thing that's neat is that any animal we would have um, eaten would have been a grazing animal, Absolutely. not a grain-fed animal. And so the quality of that fat would be very different from the quality of a grain-fed animal's fat. You know, grain-fed tends to go in the omega-6 and 9 direction, grass-fed, you know direction, less information. Um, yeah. Thank you, though. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. Other questions or comments? I would like to talk about the not showering. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Because I have been staying in a place with truly toxic water, and the trick to not showering and not offending people is changing their clothes much more often. So there's more laundry, but no showering. And I'm very, very ill, and it's been sort of mysterious why I'm happy. Mm -hmm. Because what comes with a terrible Crohn's and colitis crisis is usually misery. Yes. And I'm suffering 
suffering enormously without suffering. It's to say pain and suffering are not the same thing. And I'm delighted to know this because we've been going, why are you in such a good mood? Well, you're getting worse and maybe this be the showering. And <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. I'll, I'll see if I can find that. If you give me your contact information, that article, um, I can send it your way. But yeah, interesting. And it just goes back to hygiene is good, too much hygiene is not necessarily better. And in fact, the medieval people thought bathing was dangerous, and they changed their linens so often because that's how you clean yourself without water, is by bathing it going to your clothes and then you wash your clothes. And so, right. The other, the other thing is that soaps have changed. You know, and the harshness and intensity of the things we use to cleanse our body. Very, very different from basically like lard based, lard and ash based soaps, or even botanical things like soap work that would have been, that don't really like strip us completely of our oils and. And oil with strigils and all of that. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you. Yeah. I think the article in the New York Times is called The Great Unwash. Uh -huh. Nice. <laughs> The Great Unwashed. The Great Unwashed. Thank you. Take that, right, hygiene and stripping and killing of skin flora, and you take the lack of phytonutrient density in our food, and you take putting us all into little boxes outside of nature, and you take the sort of like, I mean, people are fighting against art too right now, you know, um, in the science community as well. And art is so powerful and important way to connect to that fractal dimensionality we were talking about. One thing by itself may not be enough to cause spirit sickness. We've done it in so many different ways that I can't, I mean, I totally understand why people feel the way they feel like this. Um, and because spirit sickness feeds back to immunological well-being, um, inflammatory balance, etc., um, a lot of times you do see somatic expressions of spirit sickness as well. And like I was saying at the beginning, it's going to be almost impossible to correct those without having an ecological Right, that looks at our supply chain, that looks at the types of soaps we use, the types of environments in which we live, etc. So, thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Um, thanks for putting the building in. Uh -huh. A number of years ago, Christopher Alexander uh, wrote a book called The Timeless Way of Building. It's three or four volumes of basically patterns of human dwelling and like how we create it and what happens and how that changes us when we're in. And like the first volume, there's hardly any talk about how we're building. It basically spends an entire book trying to discuss how we talk about patterns that feel alive and make us feel alive. Right? Mm -hmm. so this is like the whole first volume is yeah. just like the basis of like how we deal with this. Um, his contention is that Buildings that are alive are actually objective. We can feel it if we allow ourselves to do such a thing. And then looking at a building which is dead and feels dead, once we allow ourselves to like get out of like our opinion about it and really like feel the building, what it feels like to sit there, <coughs> what it feels like, you know, to come up to it, walk around it, look through the window, it's actually an objective thing and it resonates in us. Um, the second one is patterns, and like some of those patterns have to do with like organizing an individual building. Some of them have to do with organizing a town, a whole culture. Mm -hmm. You know, like <clears throat> cottages for children to go use that are near 
the main ones. Like all this stuff, it's huge. You yeah. wonder why people feel like right. separated and alienated. Look at like suburban design. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we only have ourselves to blame. So mm -hmm. I just bring this up so that people can study on their own time something that dovetails really well with what you just presented us, which is you know sort of like a cohesion of like why we're here. Right. Um, and the timeless way of building is what it's called. Thank you. So, timeless way of building. And Christopher Alexander. <laughs> Those types of patterns are in everything. Yeah. So architecture is not immune. And in fact, I think if our living spaces and our communities were structured in different ways, they were more organic. Anyway, thank you. Good point. All right, thanks again, you all.